Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming for our sixth annual um, Community Information Day. We've been doing this six times. It's very exciting and it grows. It's very cool. Give it a cheer. Give it a cheer. Fantastic. Very good. It is pretty good. You know, it brings everyone together within the community, which I think is great. And it also brings together a lot of our, our teachers and service providers. We have people from DET. We've got people, yeah, it's probably, <laughs> probably yeah, go, yes, good on you. Yes. We have people from um, eye surgeries all over Sydney and New South Wales. We've got um, speakers and we've got patients and their families all over New South Wales. And it's all very pretty. It just brings us all close together. We've got all the key service providers here today for you to have a chat to. So I'm pretty excited about it. So I want to get, I just want to bring out the uh, usual housekeeping stuff. Um, now we've got exits. Um, um, what they do is they're behind me and to my right, to your left, um, follow the signs or someone in front of you should you need to use it. There's a bathroom directly behind me for males and around the other side of the block is females. Uh, if, it's, if you uh, would like to connect to the Wi-Fi network here, um, there's a little sign that's near the door, but for those who can't see it, it's called Biz Castle Ray is the network, and the password is CAST2016 to a capital C. If you need help with that, let me know. There's two breaks today, 11 a.m., 1 p.m., um, 11 a.m. being morning tea, 1 p.m. being lunch. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We'll do our very best to keep on time today. For um, people who need it, I'll use an audible bell that's five minutes before the end of your speaking time, otherwise I'll visually signal you. The theme for today has three parts. It's got inspire, empower, and educate. And there's three parts because that describes the three parts of the Save Site Institute. One of the questions that's come up in feedback forms from previous years is, you know, we've all, like, you know, as patients, we interact with Save Site, we might see a couple of the doctors or professors, but what does the Save Site Institute do? And what I have today is a special treat for you. I've got Professor Stephanie Watson. Um, she's one of the world's top researchers in her field. And she's also an excellent public communicator. She reaches out to, um, to media. She's helped advise movies. Um, and I, I, I think she's, um, and one of, one of the best ways I could sum up what, the way Stephanie interacts with the community is a comment from a big donor. And he said, the reason that I sponsor Stephanie's work is because I know that she interacts with the community and listens to their needs. It's not about um, prioritizing publishing papers, it's about working with us, with the community. Um, Stephanie has a, a great uh, background in, uh, she's, she's featured on Young Inventors, uh, which is a show on the ABC, and um, she's been instrumental as one of the inventors of the artificial cornea. Um, she's one of the top researchers at Save Site, and she's gonna help us sort of piece together the mystery of what the Save Site Institute does. So please put your hands together for Stephanie Watson. Okay, welcome everybody, welcome. Thanks for giving up your time to come here today. Um, thanks also for the invitation to speak and give you a bit of an idea about the Save Site. And I'm calling this talk, The Save Site Institute Explained. Okay, so first of all, if I can advance the slides. That's my, Matt, do you know how to advance the slides? Okay. Oh, there we go. So I just thought Matt's told you a little bit about me, but I thought I'd just give you a little bit more background about how I came to be at the Save Site and why it's so important um, to me. Uh, and I went to medical school. I went to Sydney University. I did a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, which is the basic training you need to do to become a doctor. But I became very much interested in, in how we're going to solve the problems for the future. And that led me to research. So I did what's called a Bachelor of Medical Science, which is an extra year of the degree. Um, and, after, and you learn during that year about the basics of how to do research. Following that, I then um, became quite interested in, um, in eye research and, and in, in helping people to see. So I went um, to two places. First of all, I went to um, Oxford 
um, University and uh, spent some time there looking at neurology and then I went to Africa to Kenya and I worked in an eye clinic there and that really set me on the path to thinking, wow, I want to you know, spend my career um, trying to save sight. Following that, um, at the university, I went up to Newtown one day and I met Fred Hollows there doing a book signing. And I said, um, Fred, you can you know, sign my book. I want to do, you know, become an eye doctor. And he said, why the bloody hell do you want to do that? <laughs> and I said, just sign the book. I was like a little timid medical student. I was like, no, just please sign the book. <laughs> so that's my, uh, that's my uh, book signing there. A and again, you know, it really inspired me along the path. Um, and I sort of ended up, after I'd done my eye training, thinking, you know, that the cornea was an area that I wanted to go into. Now, as you all know, you know, um, vision can be impaired from multiple parts of, eye, of the eye. Uh, and um, the cornea is one of those parts. It's the window at the front of the eye. So to um, sort of pursue this further, I went to Moorfields Eye Hospital in London where I did a PhD. And that PhD was looking at new therapies for people with corneal blindness. But as you know, it's not just the cornea. Worldwide, there are 253 million people visually impaired and 36 million legally blind. So we need new solutions. We need to be able to save sight on a larger scale. For the cornea, it's actually the third most common cause of blindness. It's irreversible and it affects all ages. Um, for children born with visual impairment due to the cornea, they have a lifetime ahead of them of increased morbidity. And the World Health Organization has recognized it as a priority eye disease. So this is why we need places like the Safe Sight Institute. We need to be able to fight blindness not all through treating people, through research, through clinical care. Now, who we are? Well, we're part of the University of Sydney. Um, there's the Faculty of Medicine, which has now been renamed to the Faculty of, of Medicine and Health Sciences. And we're part of the discipline of ophthalmology and we're based at the Sydney Eye Hospital. Now, um, I put this picture in here because this is apparently the world's largest hotel. Uh, and uh, it's not the first, but Sydney Medical School is actually um, the first medical school in Australia and the largest, and we're part of it. Um, it has quite a number of centres, a huge amount of staff, and it's now ranked 15th um, in the world. The discipline, the history of it, it was founded in 1977 for the Safe Side Institute. Um, and, we, sorry, the, the discipline, oh, Professor Bilson was appointed in 1977 and the institute was established in 1985. Um, we moved to the Eye Hospital in 1997. Um, and then 2009, Professor Peter McCluskey, who's here today, um, took over and um, sorry about this is just a bit tricky advancing these slides okay and now under um, Professor McCluskey's guidance we're actually ranked six in the world and that's for eye institutes so we're doing pretty well a little bit more about the the eye hospital where we're based that's basically um, dates back to 1788 uh, and it's known as the Rum Hospital because it was built on rum money. It provides a statewide quaternary referral centre for eye disease. So we see a lot of patients with um, complex um, eye conditions through there. But what does the Safe Side Institute do? So that's just a little bit, bit about sort of, you know, where we sit in the structure. You know, we sit with the University of Sydney. We're based at the Safe Side Hospital. But more important than that, you know, what do we actually do? How do we actually try to save sight? Well, as I mentioned before, we do it through research, clinical care, teaching, and community service. And I'm gonna go through each of those to tell you a little bit more. So research. So basically research is finding the answers, finding the solutions, so people can um, have improved outcomes both now and in the future. And we have a number of research groups and these are based around a number of eye conditions and diseases, but also bigger, bigger question, questions like stem cells. We try to focus on the things that cause the majority of blindness, but also conditions that aren't as common, because everyone with loss of sight deserves to have a better outcome and a better treatment. 
These are the, uh, as a summary of the various research groups that we have in the, in the Safe Site Institute. We have retina, lens, cataract, cornea, glaucoma, uveitis and ocular immunology, paediatric eye disease, ocular cancer. We're also looking um, at sort of uh, colour vision and electrophysiology. Now, if we think about research, you might think, well, it all happens in a lab. Yes, that is part of our research. We have lab research. And that's based at finding the basic mechanisms um, behind the diseases. And um, as we have, again, this is across all areas of the eye. As an example of the research that I've been involved on on this level, um, the cornea uh, is, is the eye's window. Now, it has a number of layers. Every seven to ten days, days, this top layer here is shed and replaced. And it's done, and this happens through stem cells. So this is what a stem cell does on the cornea. It sits in this little bottom zone on the bottom layer of those cells and it divides to produce another stem cell and then some daughter cells that go across the cornea and eventually shed off the eye. So it's a bit like a garden, the front of the eye and the, st and the role of the stem cells. So the stem cells are like the seeds and they provide the cells. They replenish the front of the eye. But for some patients, unfortunately, their stem cells don't work well and the front of the eye is unhealthy. This is a condition called limbal stem cell failure and what it does is result in scarring of the cornea. Now, this is a patient of mine who unfortunately uh, was injured by a beer line cleaner and the front of his eye, the cornea, became vascularized due to stem cell failure. And this condition typically affects people of a young working age um, uh, group because it's often a chemical injury and it's not treatable with standard grafting. So we're trying to find the solutions to cure this condition and we've gone to the lab. We basically have set up a, a model that we can use to look closely and see, well, if we put different factors on, can we make these cells healthier? At the SAVE site, we also do a lot of clinical research. And so we do clinical trials. And these are important for determining whether a new drug or a treatment that comes out or a device actually works. We need to know those treatments are safe and effective before they reach the clinic. Um, we do clinical trials across very early um, uh, devices and drugs and also at later stages. Uh, the clinical research also involves programs where we look at, we look at different patient groups and we see um, how we can improve their outcomes. As an example, we have the Save Site registries. Now, what is the registry and why do we need them? Well, clinical trials, some of you may or may not have been in them or been around them, but what happens in a clinical trial is you take a very standardised set of patients. We have criteria. You can only get into a trial if, you've, if you fulfill any of those strict criteria. And then we apply the treatments in a very standardised way. But as you know, when a treatment goes into the community, it's given to everybody. It's the real world. And in the real world, the treatments might react differently to how they do in a perfect clinical trial. So um, Professor Mark Gilley set up the Save Site registries and it now holds one of the largest treatment outcomes databases for macular disease in the world. It's also important in, uh, in establishing the safety of treatments once they're in the clinic. So this is uh, a branch of the registry that I run um, for a condition called keratoconus, which typically affects um, young adults and is progressive. They get progressive blurring of vision. And what we're doing with this registry, we're trying to find out which treatments work and which are the best treatments and when to deliver them. It's been quite effective. We are, have, we are collecting outcomes data at a rate of about 10% a month. Um, clinicians are able to use it to benchmark their treatments against um, other clinicians in the registry. So that way everyone can, can move closer towards providing the best care. But most importantly, we're asking patients what they think about the treatment and what are their priorities. Um, these are called patient reported outcomes and Dr. Alex Ferdy will be talking more on these later. With this registry, when patients come to the clinic, we can show them a graph of their treatment journey. We can show them what's happening with their vision 
and also what's happening with how they're coping with their vision and their life. Another example of a clinical research project um, that we have going at the SAVE site is based around corneal infection. So despite there being men, many modern antibiotics, patients still have corneal infection that can lead to blindness. In the elderly, one in 10 can lose their eye after infection. And for children, they end up with lifetime vision loss from amblyopia, which is lazy eye. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to improve outcomes. We're trying to turn this sort of outcome into this outcome. And how we're doing it is we're basically, first of all, trying to figure out, well, which bugs cause the infection? And to do this, we need to educate the registrar and training doctors on how best to take samples to identify the bugs. We're then producing guidelines to educate clinicians on the best ways to treat the condition, educating the public and the patients on uh, on um, what's appropriate therapy. So these days, many people get chloramphenicol if they have a red eye. So they go to the chemist and, and the chemist will give them chloramphenicol. But for patients with corneal infection, this can actually lead them to have a delay in presenting and also a worse outcome. So um, we're trying to educate um, the public uh, and our patients about the signs of keratitis and what chloramphenicol should be used for. We're also improving, trying to improve the patient experience. So for patients with keratitis, they get admitted to hospital and they're given eye drops hourly, day and night, um, for two days, which can be fairly traumatic and often they're admitted at short notice. And so one of our research projects recently went and asked the patients that were in hospital um, how they found the experience. They've, a lot of them found it quite difficult being told at short notice that they had to be um, you know, admitted to hospital. Uh, one patient had parked their car at a train station um, come some hours to Sydney and then be, been told, look, you have to come into hospital straight away and the ho their car was still at the train station. Um, and then when the patients get discharged, often they're not sure about things like whether they can drive, when they'll see again. So we're reaching out to the patients to ask them, what, what is your experience of care and how can we improve it? Um, clinical care. So the SAVE site also provides clinical care. And many of you might be patients of the SAVE site clinic. And we cover all subspecialty areas and we have investigations that are quite specialised and not available in um, practice outside the SAVE site. So one of these areas is electrophysiology. And that's important in diagnosing um, retinal diseases. We have multidisciplinary clinics, and this is um, a clinic run by Professor Peter McCluskey, uh, and this combines both ophthalmologists um, and a paediatric rheumatologist to ensure that we're delivering the best care. So um, in this clinic, I have a role in uh, looking at the corneal problems, uh, and part of this is, you know, in ophthalmology, we're very subspecialised. Um, we have corneal doctors, we have retinal doctors, but um, as many of you will know, often you can have a problem in more than one area as a patient. And we're looking at ways to try to make sure we bring that care together so people aren't coming to the hospital for multiple clinics at multiple different times. Also, in some con eye conditions, th there's effects on the body. And particularly for children, we need to make sure that their general health care is also the highest quality. Teaching. So we do a lot of teaching and this is really key because to deliver the care that we need for the future and to continue to save sight, we need to have an, a new generation of experts coming through. We need, to, we need to increase and expand the eye expert or eye care workforce. So we teach medical students, we teach eye registrars for the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists. Um, we teach other ophthalmologists and we do teaching for ophthalmologists that come from other countries uh, and then go back to their country and to provide specialist care. In the last um, five years, I've trained people from England, from Malaysia, from um, Vietnam, um, from Austria. Uh, it's really quite mixed. And so the safe side is, is improving the, the eye care of, of um, patients across, around the world. Nurses we train, orthoptists and other doctors. 
um, we train students. And this was a particularly proud moment for me on Thursday night. Um, myself and um, Professor Frank Logovic, both with the Save Site Institute, were nominated as Supervisors of the Year at the University of Sydney. And uh, um, our students here, uh, Maria, Alex, Daisy, um, and uh, Frank's student here, we all gathered together at the university in traditional student form and had beers and pizza. So <laughs> to, to celebrate, it, which, is, uh, which was nice. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's really important. I, I think having this link to the next generation, um, providing for the future is really important and um, it's really, this is a, was a very proud moment because it shows that after I've sort of finished and retired there'll be people there that will bring up and continue the work. Um, and we're the largest training scheme for eye doctors in Australia. Okay, this is an example of, of a, a student um, working at the Safe Site in research, Annette Hoskins. Um, she has obtained NHMRC funding, and so that's a very prestigious type of medical research funding. It's the National Health and Medical Research Council. And she's looking at ocular trauma. Because trauma is actually the second most common cause of corneal blindness. And the tragic thing is that 90% is preventable. So she's working on an international study, which we've called iGATES. Um, stands for International Globe Nanaxal Trauma Epidemiology Study. We just needed to get the I in there to make it modern and trendy. And the, what we're trying to do is find out, well, why people are getting eye trauma. And uh, we've found out some simple things, like a lot of people aren't wearing eye goggles, you know, unfortunately, in the workplace. Um, in, we're, we're collaborating with countries like Singapore and India, and there they've got huge problems with firework injuries. And so what we need to do to solve ocular trauma is not just do the research, but we need to change policies and we need to advocate for those policies once they're changed. Um, community service. Another part of this is the eye bank, and this is providing corneal tissue for corneal transplantation. And this tissue goes out across New South Wales um, and the ACT. It's used to, um, for surgery, but also used for research. But another community service is, edu is, is again education. I alluded to this when I spoke about chloramphenicol. Now, uh, another area where we've found um, uh, there needs to be education of the profession uh, and the community and the public is stem cells. I was just speaking um, a couple of days ago at the American Academy in Chicago in a stem cell session. And the theme there was that basically stem cells hold a lot of hope but there's also a bit of hoax. Um, and we need to be able to ensure that people are actually getting real stem cell therapies. Uh, in America, um, there were patients that received stem cell therapies injected into their eyes and they went blind. They thought they were in a clinical trial, they weren't. Um, because people want hope, sometimes they seek treatments that, um, that don't work or even worse, put them at risk. And unfortunately, this is now the case with stem cells. There are unregulated clinical trials. Um, there are expensive treatments. And for some of them, there's no evidence that they work. And some of them have been shown to be harmful. So we've put together this position statement um, to educate the profession. Uh, but we've also produced a pamphlet to educate patients and the community about whether they should have a stem cell treatment. Um, and this leaflet. Uh, says, look, look, basically as a patient or someone thinking about a stem cell treatment, you need to get some more information. You need to ask these questions. You need to find out if the stem cell treatment has been um, trialled and whether it works. We're also getting our message out to the public. This is one example of it. Um, in my practice, I came across a number of children that unfortunately had lost sight from vitamin A deficiency. And this was through a poor diet. So they were basically eating chips and Coke. Uh, and, and this was in, in suburban Sydney. And this, ch this um, child here, Cian Moore, at the time was in, from Perth. And they flew all the way to Sydney because he was progressively going blind and, and nobody knew what it was. They thought, look, maybe he needs a stem cell treatment. 
So he ended up in my clinic and uh, I looked at his eyes and I thought, my gosh, your eyes look similar to what I saw in Africa. You know, you have vitamin A deficiency, which shouldn't really be occurring in Australia because, you know, supposedly we have good nutrition. It's a disease of malnutrition. Um, but when I asked him what he ate, he, he basically had only eaten chips and Coke, you know, for quite some years. Um, and no, he'd seen multiple medical professionals and nobody had asked him what he ate. So we put this story out there and it had a combined reach of over 8 million in social media. Recently, his story has been featured in a film called Vitamania that I've been advising on about the sense and nonsense of vitamins. And what it really highlighted is, is that, as, you know, um, that any patient with whatever condition, we still need to go back and think about simple things such as diet. We need to ensure we have the right diet for our eye health but also our general health. So where are we going? Um, well, at the moment we're number six. It's always better to be number one. And if you can't be number one, you've got to be number five. But it depends how many children you have. So, <laughs> so if you've got three like me, then you've got to have you know, equal threes as number one. Um, but you know, we really want to, um, we want to improve what we're doing. Um, we want to stay ahead of the game. And how we're doing this is, is through collaborations. So we're reaching out beyond our walls to the world and locally. But most importantly, we need you. We need the community. We need the patients to let us know, um, you know what we're doing and whether we're heading in the right direction. So tomorrow, for the safe side, we're going to continue with the innovation. We're going to look towards developing new therapies. We're going to educate and improve practice. We're going to seek partnerships. And the eye experts that we've trained, I hope, will become part of these networks of the future. And we're also going to look at policy in order to transform lives. But most importantly, we're going to seek to have better patient outcomes. We're going to seek to deliver treatments and outcomes that are meaningful for the community and for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. That was really appreciated. And uh, congratulations on being the Supervisor of the Year. I know a couple of um, Professor Watson's students, they all speak very highly of you. So, um, and that's really important because, you know, I know you said when you retire, uh, I know just looking at you, I, I assume that's some decades off. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is um, the, um, I, I think it's great that we've got, um, you, know, you know, we're one of the leading institutes training up people from all over the world and people traveling all over the world to learn from us. I think it's great. And it really goes to what the Safe Side Institute's all about. It's really, I mean, these are high stakes um, clinical treatments and you want to work with people that you can trust. And it's good to see that we can work with some of the leaders in the world. Um, as part of our theme today, we are um, talking about inspiring us. And we're going to try something um, um, a little bit different. We've got Jan McLeod. Now, Jan um, has 20 years experience as senior management and she's worked um, with some very high performance um, individuals that, that, that run uh, large companies and her current consulting business works with trying to help these people reach their peak performance and it's all about working with them on their cognitive approach and it's all about working on, on, on other approaches with nutrition and so on and so forth. Um, she's um, a, a in-demand speaker. Um, she speaks regularly and we're privileged to have her um, give us a bit of a talk today. And um, I would like to invite Jan up to um, give us a talk on high performance. Thank you. Okay. I'm quite little, so I'm going to pull this down and I'm just going to make sure these, uh, the technology works. Ah, yes, it does. Okay. 
Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to come along. Um, but first of all, um, I also want to congratulate you. Um, I met um, Professor Peter McCluskey in one of the workshops that I delivered um, for a professional body that he is part of, um, and he invited me along today. And I've really got to congratulate you on the work you're doing. It is uh, quite inspiring for me personally. So we have 30 minutes and well, I really have three things that I wanted to talk to you today. The first is let me just introduce myself um, and maybe give, give you a bit of a little bit of a background as to why I'm actually passionate about this topic um, that I call peak performance and high performance mindset. Um, when I was 11, I was a very high energy, happy kid who loves school, and within a reasonably short period of time, um, I was crying each morning, I didn't want to get out of bed, and I didn't want to go to school. And it turned out, with a bit of investigation, that I'd actually had an autoimmune disease. So at a very early age, my health and well-being became the centre of my world. Um, and what it meant, or what an autoimmune disease means, is that there's part of my body that my body sounds kind of weird, but doesn't recognise as belonging to me. And for me, it's this thing in my throat, which we call the thyroid. And if you want to think of this simply, what is the thyroid? It's the thing that's the engine in the car. So it's the sort of size of the engine you've got that keeps you running each day. So um, from an early age, health, well-being, energy became central to who I was and how I lived my life. Um, I went on. I went, into cor I went to university, I went into corporate, um, I did a business role, and eventually I decided that I wanted to do something different where I was giving back to the wider community. So I retrained in nutrition, and now I combine my business experience with my nutrition. And I focus on two things. The first thing I focus on is something I call peak well-being. I don't say perfect well-being, I say peak well-being. So what I'm going to do today is try and give you some messages about how you can optimise your well-being given your circumstance. A little bit like me, the autoimmune disease is still with me, it's ebbed and flowed and as I'm getting a little bit older, it's starting to present different challenges for me. The second thing I, I focus on is something I call a high performance mindset. And what I really mean by that is I'm helping people be aware of the way they think. Because you are what you eat, but you're also what you think. And so it's bringing people awareness as to how they think and how that shapes their choices and therefore in particular influences their well-being. So let me move on. My first task today is to just introduce in a little more depth the three themes of today. The first one is education. Now, we've talked and we've heard a lot around research, but when you're sitting there and you're listening to the speakers today, what I would encourage you to do is identify the new insight or the learning that resonates with you, with where you're at, with the challenges that you're being faced with, or the challenges of those people that you're working with and what they're being faced with. Because what I know, I love education and I love study, is that we can learn a lot, we can listen to speakers, but we can end the day with our brains full and feeling a bit overwhelmed and work, walk away having learnt some things but not applied them. So try and put a filter on as to what it is that you want to learn today, what you hear that you think will be of most use to you. Because that brings me to the second theme, and that's empower. The word empower to me is all about building a toolkit of strategies because you need the strategies in order to apply the learning or the insight. So you need to identify the insight, the new learning, the education, the piece of research that may significantly shift the quality of your life or those you're working with, but you also need to know what is the strategy that you'll need to benefit from it to truly leverage the full value of what it's offering. And the third theme is inspire. So if I have to sum up inspire, inspire to me means your call to action. You can see I've thrown a lot of words up there. 
Inspire is what you will require personally to be stimulated, motivated, caused, persuaded, encouraged, influenced, roused, moved, stirred, spurred, or energised to take action and sustainable action. I know somebody with a, a, a disease that I've lived with all my life that I know what I need to do, but I don't always want to do it. So what I need to do is draw deep about what is going to inspire me to do those things that I need to do every day. When I was asked to, um, to come and speak with you today, I was actually reading um, a magazine a couple of weeks later. It's a, a magazine called Womankind. It's a little bit different to your standard magazine. And it's full of quite often these amazing quotes. And by sheer accident, I came across a quote which I thought was quite compelling that I would share with you today. The quote is, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. That quote is actually from Helen Keller who, as you may know, was actually um, subject to an illness just before she was two and was left deaf and blind. And I think what she was doing is she was trying to impart this concept or these themes of education, empowering yourself with strategies and inspiration. And if you look at Helen Keller's life, she was truly um, had a clear vision of what she wanted to do. She was the first deaf and blind person to actually earn a bachelor's degree. She spoke five languages, including Latin, French and German. And she, came, she led her life to become an author, an activist and a lecturer. So she had a clear vision. So what I'd also say to, uh, say to you is I'd encourage you to think about what your vision is for yourself. We don't all need to be Helen Kellers. I'm certainly not a Helen Keller. But you need to understand the why of what you want to achieve and how you want to live your life and the quality of how you want to live it. There's two more things that I want to touch on today in the time I have with you. The first is nutritional health and well-being. Won't be a surprise, being a nutritionist that I am, that I really want to give you some simple but some clear messages. I was horrified to hear of the patient with a vitamin A deficiency in a country like our own. But unfortunately, I am in clinical practice, um, as well as uh, doing a lot of business work around health and well-being and high performance. I too often see, or I have clients and patients who come to me, where I find they're not well because they're not doing the simple things. So people say to me, well, what's nutrition about, Jan? Isn't it just about food? And my answer is, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. Nutrition is about food, but it's actually more than food. So I have a statement, and it's going to sound like a foreign language when I first say it, but bear with me and let me explain it. Nutrition is the science of turning non-self into self. Okay, sounds like a bit complicated, but actually it's not because non-self is food. Non-self is a banana. Non-self is a tomato. Non-self is a piece of chicken. Non-self is some fish. Non-self is some nuts and seeds. And what your body does is it takes on that food, you chew it and you swallow it and it enters into your digestive system. And that digestive system is like the gateway to your body. And what its job is, is to take the food that you've eaten and actually extract the nutrients from it so it can actually make you. Actually make you. Make your hair, make your skin, but also repair and maintain you. So there's really three things, whoops, that happens. You grow, you repair, and you maintain. And that's based on the quality of the nutrients that you take on. So food is not just food, and it isn't just about energy in, energy out, because the quality of what you eat depends on whether or not you're getting the quality of the nutrients to consistently repair you, to maintain you, and grow you. So let me give you an easy example. We've all got blood inside our bodies and we know that it circulates around us. And in there we know we've got blood cells. And those blood cells have oxygen attached to them. 
And that oxygen actually goes all through your body. And you can think about every cell in your body having a little energy battery, and it needs oxygen to work. Those red blood cells need to be replaced every 120 days. Think about the last time you had a flu or a bug and you didn't feel well. We've all had one and we didn't feel good. You have an immune system, and part of that immune system has these things called white blood cells. Those white blood cells need to be replaced about every four to five days. I could go on. I could tell you how often your skin is turned over. I could tell you that the lining of your digestive tract is turned over every few days. I could tell you about your skeleton and how it's replaced. So the message from me today is quite simple. Food is not just food. Food carries and contains the nutrients you need to repair, to maintain and to grow you on a daily, on a weekly and a monthly basis. Now, I'm not, I hope I'm not coming across as a bit of a, you know, a, a, a strict food regime person because actually I'm not. But here's a message that I do have to give you. There was recently a new report out last month from the National Health and, and Research uh, Institute. And it sort of broke my heart because this is what it said. It said that 99% of Australians are not eating sufficient serves of vegetables. We need about five serves at least a day. In fact, you could eat six or seven and it's not going to hurt you. But on average, we're only eating somewhere between two and three. It's said that 33% of our energy is coming from soft drink, cakes, lollies and chips. Not good news. A third of 25% uh, of Australians have a chronic health disease. Way too many of us are overbeaten, uh, overbeast or overweight. Even when you look at a SPAN report, which is looking at New South Wales school children, we know that about 18% of our school kids are, are overweight and about 6% are obese. So we're not actually focused on the simple things that we need to do. There's a statement that I make, and that is that we're overeating, but we're starving ourselves of nutrients. So, another simple message. In what you eat, try and aim for 60 to 70% of that being whole, fresh food. Because I'm sure everybody here has heard of the golden arches in some form. It wasn't them who discovered that bright food was attractive to us, that food smelt good, that it could taste good. It was actually nature. So nature provides us an array of all those things that we eat. And based on your health condition, you'll probably have a greater need for those nutrients that are repairing and maintaining and growing you every day. Let me go back. Oh, I've jumped way forward. Sorry. Bear with me. Ah, that one. OK. Another small statistic to give you to maybe raise some awareness. There's a lot of research out there that says that we underestimate by 40%. Yes, I said 40%. Not just how much we eat, but what we eat because many of our decisions are automatic. The brain kind of makes decisions in two types of ways. It makes an automatic decision which is largely driven by habit, which we just make and we don't think about. And then there's a type of decision where we have to stop, we have to um, expend effort, thinking, analysing, in order to arrive at a conclusion or a decision. So, if 40% of your decisions are automatic, it means that you really need to actually invest that effort in developing and cultivating those basic habits every day that you don't need to think about. And here's one simple strategy I can give you to think about. It's called a healthy plate. So we, I can talk about serving sizes and I can talk about macronutrients and micronutrients and I can even get into topics like epigenetics and nutrigenomics. But really, if we boil it all down, a healthy plate is a really simple message to take away. 
And what it's saying to you is that when you construct your plate, try and aim for 50% of it to be fruit and veg. 50% of it to be fruit and veg. Try and, and, and fruit and veg, so mandarins, um, bananas, blueberries, strawberries, and all of your veg, your capsicums, your corn, your sweet potato, your salads, uh, your carrots, all of those great things. 25% to be quality protein. So we've got all our meat proteins, we've got chicken, we've got fish, barramundi, salmon, tuna, we've got lean red meat, but we've also got our plant proteins like um, beans and chickpeas and lentils and nuts and seeds. And then the last 25% is quality carbohydrate. So when you hear me use that word quality carbohydrate, the word I'm really implying is carbohydrates with fibre. So fibre has many roles in the body. It will smooth and stabilise your energy levels. It will actually trap wastes and pathogens and take them out of your body when you go to the loo each day. But it also serves an amazing role in the large intestine where it goes down there and it ferments and it actually produces these things we call short-chain fatty acids and butyric acids which actually feed the bacteria in your large intestine. So you've all probably heard the statement now, because it's made quite often, that as much as 80% of your immunity resides in your gut. Well, a lot of that is driven from the bacteria and all the other um, uh, microbes that actually live there. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but in terms of ratios of microbes to human cells, we know it's somewhere 8 to 10 microbes to one human cell. So it shows you or demonstrates the influence. We're sort of like extraterrestrial bug breeders, I think, rather than humans that inhabit the earth. So think about what you eat. Take away the healthy plate. And next time you're constructing your meal, think about your ratios and whether they're, they're where they should be. The third thing and the last thing that I want to mention to you is this concept of resilience. And in doing that, I want to share one more quote with you. And this quote is from Charles Darwin. And what he said was, it's not the strongest, nor is it the most intelligent species that survives. Rather, it's that which is adapted, adaptable to change. So with someone with an autoimmune disease that I've lived with all my life, I am constantly adapting, refining and changing. I'm not trying to drive through when my body's send, sending me a signal that it's tired. I'm not trying to drive through when um, uh, symptoms that I know in my gut might be flaring up because they're strongly associated with the progression of my disease but rather I'm listening to my body. I understand the challenges that I have in front of me and I'm thinking about what I need to do about those challenges. Helen Keller was deaf and blind. She adapted. She was a massive proponent of supporting new technology. She believed that what you needed to do was understand the challenges that you faced and then work out your path towards actually living life to your full potential based on the vision that you have for yourself. <laughs> and that brings me to this concept of stress. It's something that I talk about a lot and people ask me to talk about. Stress is a state of physiology. It's triggered by many things. And in the, in the life that we live today, which is incredibly busy and seems to be getting busier and busier, it, there's also a lot of complexity. So when you think of resilience, stress is normal. It's a common part of life. We can't escape it. What we need to do is we need to be adapting. We need to be finding our way to work through it. Now, many of you have eyesight challenges, very confronting and very challenging. But I encourage you to continue to adapt, to work out what you need to do to take the step forward so that you can better live with the challenge or maybe resolve or redress the challenge that you've got. I'll repeat it again, resilience is not about the strongest. It's not about the most intelligent, nor is it about the most perfect. What it's about is adaption, refinement, changes, 
What do you need to take the next step? And if you think about the three themes today, that's what they're trying to help you do. Be more resilient. Education, it's about giving you new insights. Empower, it's about trying to provide you a strategy to benefit and leverage from that insight. And inspiration, I've looked at the program today. You have some amazing speakers here and people who've been on amazing journeys. One final strategy for you based or anchored in resilience. It's one I use all of the time. I call it the STOP strategy, nice and simple. And the letters stand for four things. So when you find yourself overwhelmed, when you find yourself frustrated, or when you feel like you want to curl up and pull the, the, the covers over in bed, which sometimes we all feel like, think about this one. The S is for STOP. It's for taking a pause because today everything seems to want to move us faster and faster. So it's actually taking a moment of reflection. Then I want you to breathe. We can talk about all the sophisticated stress management strategies, but would you believe breathing is actually one of the easiest and fastest ways to move out of that stress physiology of that fight or I'm going to uh, run away into what I call your rest and your digest system? And the aim is that you want to breathe out longer than you breathe in. O is to observe. What are you thinking? What are you feeling and how are you behaving? And then taking a moment to actually what I say reset or recalibrate. So decide how do you want to feel? What do you want to think? What will be most productive for you? And how do you want to behave and then proceed? My final message. A smorgasbord, we know, is a table full of food, yeah? And it's, think about all the things that you love to eat, even things that I call the sometimes foods like chocolate or a cake or a muffin. And a smorgasbord has all of these things laid out. And our natural instinct is wanting to go and eat the lot. But if we do, we'll often feel overfull, bloated, heavy and lethargic and wishing that we'd maybe had one or two or possibly only three things. So I want you to think about today's session a little bit like a smorgasbord of information. Again, I want to encourage you to identify the learning or the insight that you think has most value to you the strategy that will allow you to benefit, to leverage, to empower you or those you work with or your family, and at what you need to inspire yourself. What will propel you to take that call to action, to keep on doing what you need to do, even when you might be feeling like you don't really want to? Thank you very much for your time today, and I wish you um, a great learning day. Thank you very, very much. Um, I know that some of you probably have questions for our speakers. So what I might try and do is encourage you to seek the speakers out during the break and so we can hold primarily the time. Now, we've just talked about high-performance eating. Um, I know a high-performance um, athlete who once was interviewed and during that interview, she said if she was the ruler of Australia, what would she um, make a new rule for? And she said... I would make a rule that there'd be chocolate Tuesdays, that everyone would have to eat chocolate on Tuesdays and they wouldn't get fat. Um, and that indicates the kind, of, um, the kind of high energy and the high, uh, you know, just, just the general happiness of our next speaker, Brodie Smith. Brodie is a high performance athlete. She has played goalball for locally, nationally and internationally, I think most recently in Budapest. Um, she's, just, she's just a very bubbly person. And what's good about Brodie is that she's not just playing goalball, but she's going to be teaching the next generations of Australia. So if the future of Australia is in her hands, she will be a primary school teacher. That's what she's training for. Um, but I think that what, what, what the best part is that, you know, in the past, um, 
uh, these days we've always focused on career and we've always focused on school and these things are very important as you know but we want to help inspire some ideas um, and help um, look for other things you can do outside of those things so as part of our theme i'd like to introduce Brody smith to talk about her life with sport and goalball put your hands together Brody. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people here this morning. Uh, as you have heard, my name is Brody Smith, and I'm an athlete who plays goalball, a team sport for the vision impaired. Today, I'm here to talk to you about goalball, the impact that it has had in my life, and my top tips for surviving life as a person with a vision impairment. However, before I get started with my sport talk, I thought I would start by sharing some of my story with you. For most of my childhood, I lived life without the slightest knowledge of vision impairment or the impact that it has in the lives of so many people. Sure, I was clumsy, tripped over things all the time, ran into a few poles resulting in concussions, but there was never anything that indicated to my parents or myself that I might have a vision impairment. I remember that it was in year five when everything changed. My brother went for a routine check to the optometrist and over a period of months and more doctor visits, my brother was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. After hearing the diagnosis, my, brother, my parents began to research RP to gain a better understanding of exactly what it entailed. During this research period, they came across a list of symptoms, which included low night vision and clumsiness. After hearing these, it did not take them long to figure out that I might have RP too. Following this revelation, I suffered through several tests and multiple eye drops until the conclusion was reached that I too had retinitis pigmentosa. In fact, my case of RP was so much worse than my brother's that I was and still am considered legally blind. For those of you who don't know, retinitis pigmentosa is a degenerative eye condition that reduces an individual's field of vision progressively until they have little to no vision left at all. Imagine how life-changing this would have been for an 11-year-old. What I had thought and planned my future to be had been completely flipped on its head in a short period of time, and a long road of understanding and learning now stood before me. However, it was along this road, at a point where I was really struggling with the acceptance of my RP, that I was introduced to Goebel, and it was one of the best things that has ever happened to me. So... Bear with me. <laughs> so, goalball is a truly interesting sport. How many of you here have heard of goalball today? Oh, that's actually quite a large number. I'm impressed. Um, normally, this is the point where I would begin to explain what goalball is and how it is played. However, if you don't know what it is, um, you would all be looking at me with uh, blank stares of confusion on your faces. So, if you wouldn't mind turning your attention to the screens, I'll let a short video fill you in instead. Gonna work? Goalball was devised in 1946 as a rehabilitation activity for visually impaired World War II veterans. It was introduced to the world at the 1976 Paralympic Games in Toronto and is played by both men's and women's teams. Goalball is exclusively for athletes with a visual impairment. To be eligible, athletes have less than 10% vision remaining or a visual field restricted to 20 degrees. Participants wear blackout masks whilst on court but cannot be touched unless permitted by the referee. The court is 18 metres by 9 metres. Each team's goal stretches the entire width and is 1.3 metres high. The hard rubber ball has a diameter of 25 centimetres. Two bells inside the ball help orientate the players of the direction of the oncoming ball. The string placed under court lines also give the players orientation. Whilst players in progress, complete silence is required in the venue to allow the players to react to the ball. The object of the game is to roll the ball into the opposite goal, whilst opposing players try to block the ball with their bodies. 
There are three players per team on court at any time, with a maximum of three substitutes. Each match consists of two 12-minute halves separated by a three-minute break. Teams have 10 seconds from first defensive contact to get the ball across the centre court line. The game is won by scoring the most goals in the allotted time, or if one team leads the other, by 10 goals. A tournament begins with a round-robin phase. The top four teams from each group will progress through to the quarter-final and semi-final elimination matches as they strive to reach the final. Goalball is unique. The hush of the crowd and the high degree of skill, tactics and split-second player reactions create a spectacular sport. So, as you have just seen, Goalball is a unique sport that was designed specifically for individuals with vision impairments after the Second World War. The ball has bells in it and everyone wears eye shades. And let me tell you, it is a mix of pure excitement, fear and joy when blocking a ball hurtling at you from the other end of the court. Sorry, just lost my place. <laughs> I began my global career five years ago after experiencing a demo during an RIDBC Braille camp. I remember putting the blindfold on for the first time and attempting to play the game with as much grace as I could muster, which wasn't a lot. I enjoyed it so much that I had my parents take me to the next official training session in Parramatta so that I could learn more about the sport and how to play it properly. And ever since that day, I have never looked back. I feel like I need to clarify something here before I carry on. You see, for me to start playing a goalball, a sport, was a really big deal in my family. Throughout high school, I was that child that hated sport with a passion. I always thought it was pointless and would often question why anyone would willingly want to run around and get sweaty for fun. As you can see, I was clearly a well-cultured individual. Anyway, back to the point at hand. To suddenly try a sport and actually enjoy it was a big deal for me, considering my background and long-term hatred of sport. However, as I trained and played and trained and played, I found myself enjoying the experience and wanting to play the game more and more. It has been five years since I first tried goalball and I honestly can't imagine my life without it. So what motivated me to get involved with Goalball? I'm going to be honest with you this morning. It was because of the travel opportunities that Goalball provides. <laughs> the idea of exploring the world while I still have sight was a big motivating factor in my early days as a Goalballer, and it still is to this day. Since I began playing, if it will cooperate, nope. <laughs> Yeah, there we are. <laughs> Since I have begun playing, I have been overseas numerous times to places that I never thought I would ever get the possibility to see, including Budapest, New York, and Sweden. I've had the privilege to represent Australia at the Youth World Championships in 2017, where we won gold against Russia, and I was lucky enough to be awarded the highest goal scorer for the tournament. Following that, I made the Australian women's team and currently we are preparing for two tournaments next year that will hopefully help us qualify for the 2020 Tokyo Paralympics. That's all right, I'll leave it on that one. By playing goalball, I have already seen so much of the world and I cannot see, wait to see where else it takes me. However, as good as travel is, as time passed, it was no longer my only motivating factor to play. As my skills continued to develop, my motivations changed, and I realized that I was training more and more because it helps keep me healthy, it allows me the opportunity to represent my country, and it gives me a sense of accomplish accomplishment and pride. One other key influencer that motivates me to play is the friendships that I have formed with un other individuals who play goalball. They understand what life is like with a visual impairment, and it is enjoyable to share experiences with a group of people who can relate to you. Having considered why I play sport now as a 20 year old, looking back, I can see just how in sport, important sport is in the life of a young person. 
For me, it provided an outlet for stress and anxiety. Um, it built me up, uh, built up my teamwork skills and created relationships that are extremely important to me. Goalball or any blind sport provides a great opportunity for visually impaired individuals to experience all that sport has to offer without feeling disadvantaged or handicapped in any way. At the moment, you might not see sport as something fun or interesting. However, I would really encourage you to get, I would really encourage you to get up and try something new and give it a go. Sport has encouraged me to make friends and grow as a person in ways that I could never have imagined. And I have created many memories that will last a lifetime through Goalball. If you are interested in learning more about Goalball, there are many places that you can find information, including New, New South Wales Goalball, through, excuse me. There are many places that you can find information, including our Facebook pages, New South Wales Goalball and Blind Sports New South Wales, or through the New South Wales Goalball website. Hopefully I'll start to see some of you becoming the next generation of athletes in the Australian blind sports community. That's all I have to say about goalball this morning. However, before I conclude my talk with you all, I thought I would end with my top four tips for living life with a vision impairment. My first tip is know what you're eligible for. There are certain benefits that a vision impaired person can have access to, including a travel pass, which gives a visually impaired individual access to free public transport, a companion card, which is essentially a buy one, get one free card, and taxi vouchers, which allows a visually impaired individual to get half price taxis up to the value of $60. These benefits by no means make up for the lack of vision that we may experience as visually impaired people. However, they help to increase our independence and allow us to take care of ourselves easier. The companion card is one of my personal favorites, as though as through it, I can often buy my friends tickets to concerts and shows and split the cost of the ticket, so I only have to pay half price. <laughs> However, I didn't come across these benefits right away when I was diagnosed with RP. And I wish someone had mentioned them to me sooner, as they have had a huge impact in my life since I discovered them. They can be game changers, and I know for a fact that they can help make your life easier too. My second tip is to ask for help and support during your studies. For my high school career, I vowed not to be seen or treated differently because of my vision impairment. I made it my mission to do everything my way, just like everyone else. As you can see, I survived high school. However, if I had have asked for help when I needed it, whether it was larger print on some notes, or asked to be seated near the front of the classroom, or even asked for a light on my desk during my examinations, it would, have made my, it would have made my school career and experience a lot easier and less stressful. Having learnt that lesson the hard way, at uni, I asked for support and guidance and have found my university to be accommodating and supportive, allowing me to achieve the best education that I can. Don't be afraid to let your vision impairment be a part of your life. It is important to acknowledge it and get the help and support that you need. My third tip is to get involved in goalball. Or if not goalball, another blind sport. Coming from the perspective of a child within, within sport, it provides a great environment surrounded by people who can relate to what life is like with a visual impairment. And it also provides a great way to stay fit and develop teamwork skills in a fun way. As with all sports, it is a commitment you have to make to train and play, but the benefits you will see in your life far outweigh the physical cost, at least most of the time. I also want to encourage the parents in here this morning to get involved in a blind sporting community. I know that my parents had struggled with dealing with my and my siblings' diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. But when I finally began to play goalball, they met other parents who were dealing with the same problems and issues that come with raising a child with a vision impairment. This community spirit helped both me and my parents cope and deal with this. Oh, I just said that, sorry. Um, sport in general really does provide a supportive community for all people. And I strongly recommend that you explore it as an option for you and your child to get involved. My final tip that I would like to leave you with today is don't let your vision impairment define you 
or limit you from achieving your goals in life. For too long, I was hung up on the things that I couldn't do, such as driving a car, and it stopped me from living my best life. There is still so many things and so much more that you can do. You can travel the world, graduate high school, go to university, get a job, start a family, have a career. There is no limit to what you can do as long as you believe you can. So I want to encourage you to step out and try new things like Goal Wall and have fun with what life has to offer. As I conclude my talk this morning, I hope that I have managed to give you all some insight into Goal Wall and the impact that sport can have in your lives. And I would like to thank you all for listening and for the Safe Site Institute for inviting me here to talk to you all this morning. Thank you. That was great. I really enjoyed listening to that. So thank you so much. That was awesome. We are blessed with yet another high-performing young person. Um, Lara Narkel has a beautiful soul. You know, I've read some of her media um, talks and she's just so uh, honest with her journey that started as being totally blind through her life and, and how, you know, that blindness has made her feel a little bit, um, a little bit different and I know that a lot of her parents and, and, and um, patients can probably relate to that. Uh, but what Lara has found is she's found that she's got an awesome voice. And talking about voices, um, many of you may know that Lara performed very successfully on the, on the, on the popular television program, The Voice, and uh, really, really inspired a lot of people with her performance. So I've got a special treat. So I want to thank Lara for coming today. And Lara is going to talk about her journey uh, um, with music and sort of share some of that, that journey with us all today. So I'd like to put your hands together for Lara Narkel, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really great to be here. Good morning, everyone. I am very honoured to be here today to speak to you all. I remember being a member of the audience not so long ago, before going into year 12, actually, and thinking how inspiring the speakers at the time were. And here I am today, up here. It feels quite surreal, but that's the reality of time. It doesn't stand still, and as the seconds and minutes, weeks and months go by, we are forever growing and evolving into who we are going to be. On that note, I'd like to reflect on my younger years growing up and on some of my life-changing experiences. I am one of two siblings in my family. My brother Chris is 14 months older than me, Chris and I were both born blind due to a condition whereby my mother and father are carriers of a recessive gene, which both my brother and I inherited, resulting in total blindness. At the time Chris was diagnosed, my mother was already pregnant with me, otherwise they would not have tried to have any more children due to the risk in passing on these genes, which is one in every four pregnancies. So I'm lucky to be here at all. I just sneaked in. <laughs> Growing up without vision was all we knew. So for us, it wasn't so bad. However, for my parents, it was a different story. They had to learn to adapt to ways of doing things differently and working with services that supported us, like RIDBC, Vision Australia and Guide Dogs. Life was not bad, as we got to see many people coming in and out of the house for me and Chris. I looked forward to the time I would have with Hazita from RIDBC as a child when I was about two years old. I still remember sitting on the beanbag, 
going through some tactile books and listening to Hazita reading them to me. Using my first cane was also fun. I remember walking around the block with Regina from Guide Dogs and pretending I was pushing a pram and every now and again stop and look towards the sun as I could see the difference in brightness. I would also enjoy smelling the different food smells coming from different houses or hearing other people talking in different languages. Life was good. One day, my father bought an electric piano from a garage sale to add to our room of toys, and I found that I liked to sit and work out the sounds coming out of each note. I spent a lot of time doing that, as mum was always busy with housework and my brother. I would spend many hours experimenting with my voice and all the musical toys as my brother seemed to be more demanding on mum's time. By the age of four, my brother was diagnosed with severe autism. I had no idea what that meant at the time, only that I was left to do more things on my own while my mum was frantically running around everywhere. <laughs> Music was one of those things that was there for me. I would sing everything I could hear. People still remind me about I Just Can't Get You Out of My Head by Kylie Minogue and I'm a genie in a bottle by Christina Aguilera. I used to actually say I'm a genie in a puddle. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> I, I learned what it was eventually. <laughs> bottle, not puddle. <laughs> The support I gained, I gained from State Vision during my primary school years formed most of my learning for my later years. Learning Braille as well as how to touch type using a laptop and a Braille note were great foundations to going to high school and beyond. Having a wonderful teacher like Mrs. Bengura made it all seem so good. It was as if I could see, and not only that, it was as if I could see in colour. They were happy times. I remember getting an iPhone when I was 13 being a turning point in my life. I was able to use it without any problems and having accessibility to the internet and particularly YouTube was a great tool to have to increase my bank of knowledge of not only music but watching how-to videos, whether it was to solve something about my technology or learning about other things. It was literally information at my fingertips. Later, my iPhone would become my connection with the world through Facebook and communicating with family and friends here and overseas, as I'm sure a lot of you do. Using it as a navigator for independent travel was the next major step in my life, particularly when I started university. Life was really good. I managed my way through high school with the great help of Mrs Donnelly, my vision support teacher, who assisted me from year seven to year 12. I remember getting sheet music embossed being a challenge but my music teacher got the hang of it by the end. She actually became quite good at it, I must say. <laughs> and she didn't even know how to read Braille. So yeah, like it was pretty amazing that she was able to do that. <laughs> Choosing music for the HSC was a no brainer. However, selecting other subjects was quite limiting in many ways. Chemistry or biology was not something I was able to do easily. Neither were geography or maths due to the visual aspects. I chose the arts and that's how I came to my decision to study psychology at Macquarie University. I am currently studying, um, yeah, at Macquarie. <laughs> In my second year of uni, I decided to try out for the TV show, The Voice. 
the process was much more involved than what you get to see on screen. There are several auditions before making it to the blind auditions in front of the coaches. After six months of auditions and waiting, I was told I made it through to the blinds. Yay! <laughs> that, yeah, that's literally what I said <laughs> when, I, when I got the phone call to, found, to find out that I got through. Anyway, my aim was to see if I could turn any chairs as I wanted to see if my voice alone, without knowing that I am blind, is good enough to impress the coaches. That was something I always wondered, whether people like my voice or just felt sorry for me. I was so happy to learn that two coaches turned for me and from there, I went on to the knockout round. I made it to the top 48 out of 4,000 contestants, which is a great achievement. Since The Voice, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Since The Voice, I have had many performing opportunities for corporate functions and charities, and most recently, I had the privilege of performing to the athletes of the Invictus Games. I also co-wrote a song called Love Left Behind with Roxanne Kiley and Stephen Kiley, who were my singing and piano teacher um, since the age of seven. And um, I, I used to have lessons with them every week um, for about five or six years, and they were very influential in, um, you know, like, building my confidence and shaping my music career, which is like really important. I don't think I would have done, you know, half the things like in performing if it wasn't for them. So they played a major role. I'm extremely happy to announce that the song Love Left Behind is due to be released on the 16th of November on Spotify, iTunes and other streaming services. So, you know, if you want, make sure you download it. If you, yeah, I love Spotify. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I am also completing my third year of uni with only one more semester to go before finishing my undergraduate degree. Yay! <laughs> the next challenge for me is to find full-time employment. At the moment, it seems like that's the next mountain I have to climb, convincing potential employers of my capabilities. And I actually have had um, part-time employment before. I was teaching singing and piano at a music school for about one and a half years, and that was really fun, but I'd like to actually get a proper job somewhere and like use my degree, so <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope it's not going to be too long before I find something. I must remain positive about it, as I know too well that unemployment among the blind is very high. There have been many people involved in getting me to where I am now. I thank each and every one of them, as I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for their dedication and help along each step of the way. So thank you. And now I'd like to dedicate this song that I'll be singing um, to all of those people, especially my parents. And the song is Flashlight by Jesse J. When tomorrow comes, I'll be on my own Feeling frightened of the things that I don't know When tomorrow comes, tomorrow comes, tomorrow comes Although the road is long, I look up to the sky And in the dark I found lost hope that I won't fly And I sing along, I sing along, yeah I sing along I got all I need when I got you and I 
I look around me and see a sweet life I'm stuck in the dark but you're my flashlight you get me, getting me through the night Kicks on my heart when you're shining in my eyes I can't lie, it's a sweet life I'm stuck in the dark but you're my flashlight you get me, getting me through the night Cause you're my flashlight You're my flashlight You're my flashlight Oh, I see the shadows long beneath the mountaintop I'm not afraid when the rain won't stop Cause you light the way, you light the way, you light the way I got all I need when I got you and I I look around me and see a sweet life I'm stuck in the dark but you're my flashlight You're getting me, getting me through the night Kicks on my heart when you're shining in my eyes I can't lie, it's a sweet life I'm stuck in the dark but you're my flashlight You're getting me, getting me through the night Oh, 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 you're my flashlight, light Light, you're my flash, light, 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 oh, you're my flash, oh, 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 oh yeah, 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 you and I, yeah, getting me, getting me through the night, kicks on my heart when you're shining in my eyes, I can't lie. It's a sweet life I'm stuck in the dark but you're my flashlight You're getting me, getting me through the night Cause you're my flashlight You're my flashlight You're my flashlight Flashlight. Thank you so much. That was outstanding. Thank you so much. Give her, I'll give her another round of applause. Well, I, I don't really know what to say after that. I'll, I'll have to. Um, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> look, um, we, we, look, we're looking good on time. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break. But before we take a break, I just want to point out a couple of really important things. Um, we have a new role that's just started within the Safe Side Institute. We've started it before, but we started someone new in the role, is probably more accurate. Um, Lorraine Villaray, are you around? Can you wave? or yell out. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Lorraine is our new patient care coordinator. Um, and if you've got any questions about which agency that you need, that they can help you with, with school or with AIDS or with recreation or anything like that, uh, or you're not really sure to, who to talk to, Lorraine could definitely help you. She's around during the break. Um, our speakers from this morning, if you have any questions, are around during the break. And we're all amongst friends here, so if you can't find the speaker, then I am more than certain that if you ask someone, they'll try and help you find the speaker that you're looking for to ask the question, uh, which is really important to remember. So, uh, and the other thing you should do during the break is we have some wonderful service providers that have exhibits. In, in, the, in the hall there. And if you have any questions about what they can do for you, then please stop by their tables and I'm sure they're more than willing to help you out with any questions. We're going to have a half hour break. We're going to be back here at 11.30 for Greg Olkin. He's going to run through the latest in adaptive technology. So we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.
Let me. I've got um, everything with me, so, so I've got HDMI wanna... or VGA, mate. It doesn't matter. What okay, you... let me find out what I can do for you. I've got. Um... Oh, hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, oh, yes, yes, this is Greg. Good. good. So, Greg, what? Greg needs to look. I've got a reunion tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My year. Oh, wow, that worked out well for you. Yeah, it is. Excellent. I told when they're working out which weekend. I said, "Don't get this one." Yeah, because I'm already here. I'm yeah. already here. Oh, that lady works it out. Sorry, Where's workies. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course. Okay. And you're well going. Yeah, I'm good. I'll catch up with you. You bet. I've got lightning. I've got I've got my iPad. I've got my lightning to VGA and lightning to HDMI connectors. So. He's got all my cameras. Hey. All right, beautiful. Uh, have you connected? Will we'll travel, will present. Mate, you're a champion. Can I come back to you in a second? Yeah, sure, buddy. So, uh, what, are you, what, are, what, are you, what are we connecting via? That's all right. My, my, little, my little connectors, yeah. You've got this. I don't know if that's the same. Uh, Oh, hang on. No, hang on. That's going into VGA. So let's... Yeah, so VGA usually works better here. Oh, okay. Not a problem. Yeah. So... No, 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 I know. See, but... Um, we've had... We've had... Light, now, we've had lightning... For a while. So, but all I need... I plug in there. Because it's my it's my iPad. I just need no no. no. Yeah, it's just it'll be a straight. Because see that's using that's using um because see yeah the Thunderbolt now is the same as USB C in the connection size. Sorry? Oh no, because they can increase bit they can increase bandwidth and see if you're using HDMI it does audio as well as video, where VGA um, only does... Oh, I just dropped something. Oh. What did I drop? Sorry? Oh, I've done a touch before. So, let me just... I uh, better put this on orientation lock. Okay. Here's trouble. 